This is an overview of the endocrine system. You have roughly up to 50 hormones running through your body at any point in time. Sometimes we'll say somebody is acting hormonal when the reality is we're all acting hormonal when you can see the amount of hormones that are running through our bodies. Hormone means to put something in movement or motion or to excite. And that's what hormones do is they're messengers. And these messengers are either amino acids or cholesterol, steroids, that are contributing to the response in conjunction with the nervous system to give it that overall response called homeostasis. Homeostasis is our general equilibrium that we try to achieve a normal state of range to allow us to survive on a daily basis. So this is an overview of some of the primary endocrine glands. I'd include in some of like the secondary ones because we find hormones that can be produced by the heart, by the thymus gland, by the kidneys. I didn't include those. I concluded the majority of the ones that we teach from an anatomical perspective at a beginning level. What I've also added is the hormones that they produce and then what is their impact or what's their target or effect in the body. So let's start with the pituitary because it does the most. And the pituitary, when we look at this, it looks like a cherry gland to me. It looks like a cherry, but as it hangs down, we offer this as like the master gland along with the hypothalamus but the pituitary can divide it into two regions, the adenohypophysis and the neurohypophysis. Adeno is the anterior pituitary, and I just remember A for A, anterior for adenohypophysis. The neurohypophysis is the posterior half. In the middle, we look at the histology, there's a pars intermedia, but I have these two major regions. The pituitary does quite a bit, and it's controlled by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is using regulatory hormones to control the pituitary, but it has a lot to do with growth and development or reproduction of our body. One of our primary hormones is growth hormone. What does it do? It's growth of some of our major tissues, including our bones and our muscles. When we look at these, these are all related to reproduction. So we have prolactin to allow for that apocrine secretion of milk during lactation. When we look at the thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH, this is referring to how we regulate thyroid hormones. When we look at adrenocortotropic, we're regulating the adrenal gland, but on the cortex side, which is the outside region of the adrenal gland. And then we get into controlling reproduction. So follicle stimulating hormone, we offer as FH and luteinizing hormone is LH primarily referring to when we look at uterine cycle or the menstrual cycle of females and we talk about how the ovaries develop the follicles we develop those follicles and luteinizing to prepare the corpus luteum for the uterus for implantation as if fertilization is going to occur on the monthly basis so you can see pituitary does a lot when it controls the way we grow, the way we develop and then reproduction as a whole so that's why we often call it the master gland the hypothalamus is also sending hormones to the posterior side of the pituitary that we call the neurohypophysis. So remember, the pituitary is two regions, adenohypophysis, but I put neurohypophysis here because the hormones are being made or secreted or synthesized in the hypothalamus sent down to the posterior pituitary, the neurohypophysis versus these are created within the adenohypophysis. So within the neurohypophysis, two hormones, antidiuretic hormone, ADH, it's also called vasopressin. And this is telling our bodies to keep water. So it's a messaging system to the kidneys. So you can start to see that you have what we call a cascade effect, that you tend to have one hormone talking to another to talk to another to create some type of impact. So this is an example. It's where you have the hypothalamus talking to the pituitary to go to the kidneys. Oxytocin is a reproductive hormone that we see primary for uterine contractions for the female. We also see this in the male as a reproductive hormone as well, but oxytocin contributes to uterine contractions. During labor and delivery, sometimes a synthetic form of pitocin is used to mimic these hormones to get the uterine to contract. Remember we said the pituitary talks to the thyroid. Again, a cascade effect. So TSH regulates thyroid hormones. When we get into the thyroid, when we look at our bow tie muscle, 
That thyroid produces thyroxin and calcitonin. And when we look at those, these hormones contribute to the overall metabolism or growth of our cells. So we see the energy within the cells itself that's contributed by way of thyroxin. Calcitonin is starting to do something that we control that's flowing through our blood. So it decreases the amount of calcium ions that are flowing in our blood versus we'll have the opposite effect. And we'll talk about negative feedback in this video. But the opposite effect of parathyroid on the posterior side, I have parathyroid that's secreting parathyroid hormone that's increasing the calcium that's flowing through the blood. So this is our first example to where we see a negative impact on each other, but for a common good of homeostasis. So the thyroid produces calcitonin to decrease blood calcium levels, the amount of blood or calcium ions in the blood, and then parathyroid will contribute to increasing it. And so we're talking to now parts of our bone tissue to allow for that production or decrease of calcium to get it inside the bloodstream. When we get into the adrenal gland, there's two regions, the cortex and the medulla. The outer cortex, remember we said, is controlled by ACTH. So from pituitary to the cortex, we are releasing some of our hormones that control sodium. So now we talk about calcium and sodium, heavy rely on part of our action potentials as well. And then some of our stress hormones, this increases the blood glucose because glucose contributes to the metabolism of our cells. And then medulla, this is interesting because you have the nervous system talking to endocrine system. So it's a neuroendocrine function. So where you have a straight stop from the nervous system that's going straight to the adrenal medulla to contribute to our sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight. So that's our epinephrine or norepinephrine. We often refer that as the adrenaline. And that's coming from the adrenal gland, but specifically at the medulla. Our pineal gland that we see on the posterior side as we move away from the thalamus, the pineal gland secretes melatonin. And melatonin is what's regulating our circadian cycle or sleep-awake cycle. It tells us it's time to wake up, it's time to go to bed. And we do that based on seeing that light. So this hormone will increase at night for the function of sleeping. Some people will take it synthetically to increase their sleep. But that's one of those hormones that gets disrupted if you're part of a daylight savings wherever you live. The daylight savings contributes to mess this process up of our circadian rhythm. So pineal gland, pancreas, pancreas is only about 1% endocrine. The rest of it is it's an exocrine gland for the digestive system, but it's still highly important when we get into talking about how do we control the blood sugars in our body. There's different hormones, but the primary two that we tend to talk about are insulin and glucagon. Insulin will decrease the blood sugar, and we'll talk about that in when we look at negative feedback. Glucagon increases the blood sugar. So that pancreas, although it's a small part about endocrine, it's a huge function of our body to control the sugars and how they impact the different systems. And then we get into the reproductive side that the testes and ovaries, testes are producing testosterone, ovaries, estrogen, progesterone, and that's primary to develop the sexual characteristics when we think about our secondary sexual characteristics as we get to puberty, but it's also helping with the development of sperm and then the development of our follicle that's stimulated from follicle stimulating hormone and then luteinizing hormone, part of that corpus luteum to prepare the uterus is done through progesterone. So a lot of our, not only our sexual characteristics, but just the preparation of fertilization and implantation for the growth of an egg if pregnancy were to occur. So there's a lot happening with our different hormones, and this is just a sample of it. The way this typically functions is homeostasis to create some type of balance. And we do that through a process called negative feedback or a negative feedback loop. Typically, two different hormones are acting against each other, but to create a balance for a common good, which is homeostasis. The example I give you here is if I was to eat, say, a cheeseburger, and what happens is, is I have an increase of sugar that ends up in my bloodstream from the digestion. So I increase my blood sugar. The hormone that's going to be released is from the pancreas, and that's from insulin. So insulin is secreted, and what it's doing is telling 
the cells to intake back that sugar, to get it out of the bloodstream so it's not impacting the body. We typically will uptake it in the cells and we'll do it in the liver and bring in that sugar and hold on to it or break it down or both. So I use insulin to decrease the amount of sugar that's flowing through the body. The opposite happens if I haven't eaten a cheeseburger for a while, I get hungry, my blood sugar is low, we offer for that, that you're hangry, that you're hungry and you're angry, right? Because you're not able to process things as well if you don't have the proper blood sugar in your body. So I have low blood sugar, so the opposite happens is the pancreas will secrete glucagon to tell our cells to release sugar and put it in the blood site, specifically again at the liver to allow the liver to release that sugar back into our blood stream to create that equilibrium. So this is a great example of these two hormones negatively impact each other but create a common good of homeostasis and we call that a negative feedback loop that it just continuously fights with each other to create a common balance. So our hormone system when we talk about the endocrine system these hormones are constantly th flowing through our body and they're in conjunction with the nervous system and you can see that because the structures are the same. When we did nervous system, we talked about some of these structures and how they impact the body. And then when we look at the hormones, we all have the common good of homeostasis. This is an overview of the endocrine system.